Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night sheweth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where the voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me, from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. The title of the message this morning is The Word of God. The Word of God. And it kind of is going to fall in place with Brother Ray's message this morning. And what I just talked about is concerning what business we need to take care of. If you go back in and read that a little more closely, you can see that it's a needful thing to keep the Lord's precepts. And his commandments. In view of introduction, while the heavens declare the glory of God, the Bible declares his will. You want to know? I had a young man, I may have told you this before, I had a young man at work. He, he, he claimed to be a Christian, but he was the laziest thing you'd ever want to see. And he'd just walk around, a cup of coffee and a cigarette in his hand. And he'd just be walking around, he'd talk to this person, that person. I didn't know what his job was supposed to be, but he was in our department. And one day I'm working on a CNC machine. He comes over and he says, I said, I, I acknowledge him. How are you doing? Oh, well, I'm just trying to find the, the Lord's will in my life. And I exploded. I just blew up right there and then. May have been the wrong thing to do. I said, how long have you been a Christian? And he told me, and I said, and you still don't know what the will of the Lord is in your life? I said, stop and think about that a minute. Brother Ray brought it out. The will of the Lord in our life is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. If Christ came to do the will of the Father, then what is our will? What, is, what are we supposed to do? What does God want for us? What is his will for our lives? You're alive this morning. You're here today because he's not done with you. You still have work to do. And the gospel is the greatest message that we can put out there. The speech of the heavens here says is silent. And I can see here the italicized word was put in there to help out an understanding. But other places, of, it says their voice is not heard. He says where their voice is not heard, but their voice is not heard. 
but even his eternal power and Godhead can be understood by the things that are made. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 19 and 20, it says, Because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So when we tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? They are without excuse. There's no more excuse. And they have no more excuse. Why aren't you believing in the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, <laughs> there's no excuse. None. After they've heard the word of truth. After they've heard the gospel of our salvation. We have come we have to come to the written and incarnate word for the doctrine of God. You know, I've had people tell me all my saved life, I don't want to hear your doctrine. I don't want to hear your doctrine. Well, then you need to throw your Bible away because that's all that's in there is doctrine. You know, it's not my doctrine. It's the Lord's doctrine. It's God's doctrine. He put it in there, not me. But we're to obey it. We're supposed to live it. Then in verses 7 and, and through 9, six different terms are used to express the fullness and uh, preciousness of his word. And I don't know if you caught it when I read it, but that's what we're going to cover this morning. Those, those uh, six different terms that are used to express the fullness and preciousness of his word. And first one is found in verse 7. It converts the soul. It converts the soul. Why? Because it is perfect. It says there, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, which would be our next point. But for this one, it converts the soul. It takes a perfect instrument to accomplish such delicate and powerful works as this. You know, when you really listen to a mu mu musician, <laughs> musician, musician, whether it's the piano or the flute or the harp or whatever it may be, they have the talent to bring out the best of that instrument. Now, <clears throat> Sister Michelle gets up there, she can start playing, and she, you understand what she's playing. If I get up there and start playing, you're going to say, it's time for you to leave. Because it's not going to bring forth the music that it was intended to do. I mean, I can make a bunch of noise on there. My granddaughter can make a bunch of noise on there by pounding the keys as well. But we can't bring out that beauty, that that delicate, powerful work that they were made to do. The soul needs conversion. We know that. The soul needs that. The sword of the Spirit can do it. In James 1.18, of his own will, and this is what Brother Ray, he brought this out, of his own will, will of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of fruit, first fruits of his cre creation, creatures, excuse me, of his creatures. So we are the fruits that have been born out of the gospel message. That gospel message needs to be proclaimed so other fruit can, you know, we'll know them by their fruits. And, you know, a fruit tree will produce fruit. If it doesn't, then it's no good for anything. What was it, the fig tree that, that Christ cursed? Why did he curse it? It wasn't producing anything. So he got rid of it. He cast it down, told him to cut it down. So the, the very word of God converts the soul. Nothing else will convert the soul other than that. It brings forth liveliness 
in the spirit which is dead. Nothing can quicken the spirit in you except the word of God. Nothing. There is no miraculous miracle out there that can do that outside of Jesus Christ. So our second point then is it makes wise the simple. And because it is sure. Now I consider myself simple. <laughs> I mean, I'm not a raving lunatic or I'm not, you know, we're not talking about something like that. What we're talking about is I, I am not a well-educated man. And I feel inferior a lot of times when I hear other preachers preach. But God has made the simple, me, wise unto his word. I don't know how it happened. I even marvel. I even told Brother Matthew here not too long ago. I said, you know, I answered those questions. And I says, I have to go back and say, where did I learn all this? How did I come to this stuff? You know, I don't know. It's just, it's there. God has blessed me with his word. And it is sure, even for me as a simple person. So it is sure because it is given, here it is, by the inspiration of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. There's that word doctrine again. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, I can't do any of those things unless you're here. Right? I can't do any of those. This, this was given to Timothy because he was a young preacher in a church. And I can, not because he's here, but Brother Ray, he's, you know, when I was getting closer and closer to the time of being ordained and being the pastor of this church, he said, read this verse. Read this verse over and over and over and over. So I did. And it, it, it's, it's profitable, but it's not profitable to you if you're not here. That's why there's an importance. We even talked about whether or not putting the videos out there is profitable because I don't, we, so far we haven't had anybody in the area that may have seen these come and, and, and be a part of this work. It's not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. We've got to be in church. You can listen to all these preachers. There's, there's hundreds of preachers on the internet. And you can listen to all of them, but it doesn't profit you if you're not in the Lord's house doing what he's told you to do. If you're not here spiritually, physically, and financially, then you're disobeying God. That's why there's an importance. And not only that, I just read this yesterday or last night, but you know what? There's somebody here this morning that's not here until we get here. God is here. The Holy Spirit is here. Jesus Christ is here. Now, when I was young, I used to believe that that was God's house. God lived there, and that's where he stayed, you know? But as Brother Ray pointed out this morning, that God would come down in his second of glory, and he would fill the temple. That's what he does. That's why there's a leadership here this morning. That's not because I'm preaching or Brother Ray's preaching or Brother Chuck's preaching, but because these are here. The Godhead is here and inspiring us and giving us what we need to proclaim to you. And I can't do these things. I can't reprove. I can't correct. And I can't give you instruction in righteousness if you're not here. So it all makes sense when you when you really get down and put it together. It makes wise unto salvation all who are simple enough to believe. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be anything at all because God can inspire you. And through salvation, he can give you everything you need as a believer. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3 and verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 
See, there's specifications in that. You are made wise because from a youth, you are able to be wise in the salvation because you have faith in Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important that we, we insert and push that Jesus Christ is the one who makes the difference. And that's what the world hates, isn't it? Yeah. That's what they hate the most. It's not so much us. And, and even Jesus said that if, if they hate you, don't forget, they hated me first. It's him they hate. And because we're part of it, they hate us. It's kind of like with our president. They hate the president. So anybody that's involved with him, they hate him, them too. To the, now, this is really, I mean, we are people, right? We are American people living in the same country, but half the country, because of our stand with the president, wants to put us in chains. Does that make sense? They do not have any respect for life. They do not have any respect for us. They do not have any respect for the Lord Jesus Christ. So all that they get and all that they will get and the wrath of God to come, they deserve because they've been warned. We've tried to teach them. We've tried to tell them. We've tried to show them the proper path. And they've ignored us. Third point, it rejoiceth the heart. In verse 8 there, why? Why does it rejoice the heart? Because it is right. Because it is right. It is the right thing for all the needs of the heart. So the heart rejoices in the receiving of it. When you were saved, didn't you rejoice? I mean, that was the greatest day. It's like Brother Ray said, you know, there's no greater thing or experience to see a lost soul saved by the Lord Jesus Christ come forward for baptism. There's no greater thing. And it's even more special when it happens in your own family. You know, I pray for the day. I mean, I, I know my granddaughter's here, but I'm not putting any emphasis on her. But I pray for that day. She's going to come up here. I'm praying for that day. And anybody else that comes in here that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray for that day. That's why we're here. That's why we're a mission. That's why we're trying to tell people about Jesus Christ, that they may come in and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and come and be baptized into his church. So it rejoices the heart. It is the right thing for all the needs of the heart. So the heart rejoices in receiving of it. The poor, hungry soul makes a fuss over. In Psalms 119, 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Jeremiah 15, 16, thy word was the joy of my heart. So it should joy us. The word of God should joy us. It should make us happy. We shouldn't have, have to say, uh, when we talk about the Bible, the God of the Bible, who is the God of the Bible? The one that gives us joy, the one who gives us salvation. That's who he is. That's what the Bible is, the word of God. It enlightens the eyes in verse 8 also because it is pure. It is pure as the weary uh, Jonathan had his eyes enlightened by partaking of the honey, so doth new light and vigor possess us when we taste the pure honey of his word. There's nothing any sweeter. Nothing any sweeter. He even says there, sweeter than the honeycomb, and you can't get no better than that. Psalms 119.9 uh, says, Whither all shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto according to thy works? According to thy riches? No. According to thy word. When the rich 
young ruler came to Jesus and the young man, he come to Jesus, he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus kind of questioned him, but that was insignificant of the questions because, you know, he said, well, you need to keep the commandments. You need to do this. You need to do that. He said, well, I've done all those things since my youth. So he kind of, in a way, Jesus actually trapped him so he could understand and see from his own self that it wasn't those things that he's been doing from his youth. It was this, go and sell all that I have and come follow me. See? That's why we got to bring it back to Jesus. You want eternal life? Jesus. You want eternal life? Play the lottery. No. Believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will have eternal life. Verse 9. It endureth forever. Why? Because it is clean. Because it is clean. It is the very thing a young man needs to cleanse his way. Again, 119. With all shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to thy word. See, it is in it is uncorruptible, and so it endureth forever. Because it's incorruptible, it's going to endure forever. It does and can offer everlasting life because the word itself is everlasting. This will never end. The word of God will never end. Next in verse 9, it is altogether righteous. Why? Because it is truth. It is altogether right. Right in its every warning and demand, counsel and promise. It is not only true, it is truth, and therefore cannot possibly be wrong on any point. When we come to the understanding in the place, just contemplate this, because as a pastor, and I'm sure you can ask Brother Chuck and Brother Ray this very, very thing as well. When we contemplate, you all, when we contemplate those that the Lord has given us to pastor, those that we are under shepherds over, we have to try to understand in ourselves that we're all doing our devotionals. We're all reading the Word of God. We're in our prayer closets praying constantly. And I don't mean you have to go in a closet somewhere and do that all the time. You can pray all the time everywhere. But see, unless we do those things, we don't get instruction. We don't get learning. How many people outside the church, how many people that are, you know, not here, not attending at all, how, do you think they're opening up the Word of God and they're getting everything they need? From experience, I would say, no, they're not. Why? Because they need instruction. They need a daily fellowship. You cannot get fellowship outside of being here this morning. I mean, if you meet one-on-one, -on -one, you can have some fellowship. I'm not saying you can't. The fellowship is being here this morning and being a part of this worship service. Next, in verse 10 there, uh, it is most desirable. Why? Because it is better than gold and sweeter than honey. It is better than the best and sweeter than the sweetest of all earthly things. Now again, go back. This is the word of God we're talking about. This refers to all truths in the word of God and to all the doctrines of the gospel. You can't eliminate them. They're in the, in, they're in the book. They're in, they're in God's word. 
He established it forever and ever. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church will not have any, shouldn't have, you know, we're going to have problems, but he's not going to overcome as long as we're in the word and doing the things that we need to do. The churches, like Brother Ray mentioned this morning, the churches that fail to or stop doing them, like the church at Laodicea, will stop to cease to exist. Those churches that uh, uh, Christ told John and, and that they were the letters that were supposed to be written to those seven churches, those churches didn't listen. They didn't pay attention. You can't find any of those seven churches today because they're gone. Why? Because they didn't listen. We have examples of those seven churches in our worldly churches today. Brother Ray has said many times to me, he says, we are surely living in the Laodicean times. Look at how things are going. We don't ever want that to happen here. Lastly, it is most needful. If you ever think you can get by without the word of God, you, you're, mis, you're mistaken. You're mistaken because it is most needful. Why? Because it both warns and rewards. It both warns and rewards. It warns both servants and sinners of the danger of, and doom of unbelief. The psalmist means himself. We have to include ourselves in this. We can't go by our daily lives without getting into the word of God and, and reading it and, and meditating upon it and knowing who we are and how that God can really bring us out of any situation or circumstances. So he means himself here, who was the servant of the Lord, not only in common with other saints, but as he was king and prophet. He was, wasn't an ordinary man, let's face it. He was a king, he was a prophet. But if we look at our lives and see what Jesus has done for us, are we not kings and prophets? We're going to have a robe and a crown one day. We are a priest and a high priest. We are whatever Christ is, we are heirs and join heirs with that. It assures, the word of God is needful because it assures the obedient of a glorious reward. And he touched on that. Look at all the, look at all that. Gold, silver, diamonds, rubies, emeralds, and the list goes on. What are, what are those things? They're beautiful. They're precious. They're worth something. Are we not worth something? It is both a law and a gospel, a hammer and a fire, a beacon light and bread from heaven. You know, some have asked for a long, long time this question. Can you be saved with reading the Bible? Can you just be saved by picking up the Bible and reading? And I always felt that if the Holy Spirit was leading you, and you pick, and were encouraged to pick up the Bible and read the Gospels, yes, I believe you can be saved. I still think you're going to end up going to somebody that you know and have them explain it to you. So you're going to preach to them. Just like what happened with uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. He read it. He wasn't sure about it, but he was reading it. And because he was a chosen vessel of God, the Holy Spirit sent Philip to go tell him. And where did he start? He started at the same place and preached unto him Jesus. Wonderful. How wonderful it is. Hebrew, I'll close with Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of the marrow, and is a discerner. This is what it says, is a discerner. I don't like what I read in this sometimes because it convicts me. It should convict you if you read it. Is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And all we can do is say, praise God. Aren't we glad that it does? May God bless his word to your heart today.